Let's get started. Eight days to go. Politicians seem to be listening quite a lot at the moment. They're talking a lot. They're gifting a lot. So if we, anybody's got any requests, <laughs> this seems like a good time to be making those requests. Uh, so uh, if I could ask each of you to, uh, in turn, go to the lectern and give us your, your interventions for five minutes. And uh, John, let's start with you. OK. Uh, I'm going to be really awkward and not go to the lectern. Feel I'm going to stand about here. Because I'm going to do a Rory... No, I'm not going to do a Rory Brunner. But it, it helps not to have the lectern in the way. So, 1,819 days since the last election. Uh, it feels a world ago, doesn't it, in 2010. But actually, a more chilling stat, uh, literally, as we speak, 200 hours until the polling booths close. That's how long there is left to influence this election. Now, my job as a representative of business is to remain studiously non-party political. So the only way I can deliver that is start by quoting Marx. <laughs> and the Marx I'm going to quote is Groucho Marx, not Karl Marx, because I think he's funnier. And one of Groucho Marx's famous quotes that relates to my point about 200 ticking hours is Groucho Marx said that time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. Now, we know what the first part of that sentence means, the clock is ticking and there's not much time for our political class to influence how we vote, particularly not in my case, because I've got a postal vote. But what does fruit flows like, flies like a banana mean? I haven't the faintest, and I don't think Groucho Marx had. I think it was one of his more absurd statements. And actually, that leads me to the key point as far as the business community is concerned. I don't think there is a woman or a man in Britain who knows the outcome of the general election. I endorse at least one of the points Rory made, that it isn't the uncertainty of the election result that leads me to that conclusion. It's the arithmetical tightness. It could very easily come down to a few seats here and a few seats there. One party may end up having the largest number of seats, but find it harder than the other party with a smaller number of seats to build a majority, either official or unofficial, in Parliament. And that is the thing that I think makes this election too tight to call. And the reason for that is we've gone more continental European, haven't we? We're used to elections. If you take the 1951 election, for those of you who can remember, it was before my time, when Clement Attlee was fighting it out with Winston Churchill. And between the two of them, they got 97% of the vote. And if you take the BBC poll of polls today, the two successors to Winston Churchill and Clem Attlee are going to get 67% of the vote. That's the fundamental difference. The arithmetic is now all over the place. Coalition government or forms of coalition government look more likely. That's more challenging for business. It's more challenging for business to get its messages across. It's more challenging for business to be heard. And if, as is a possibility, we don't have five days after the election of uncertainty, we have more days and more possible variations, then I think it behoves business at that point to come out of Perda and to speak up more clearly, because we're not then seeking to influence how people vote. We're trying to remind the politicians who are locked behind doors in smoke-filled rooms what the really important issues are. And I would say there were six, but you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through them in any detail. And they fall into three pairs of two. The first pair of two are things from this parliament that, frankly, the business community would say, irrespective of who the new government or mixture of government is, needs banking. They simply need banking as a legacy from this government and building on, not starting again. And I think the two that the business community I speak for, and I'm privileged to speak for 190,000 businesses, are most concerned about are continuing to tackle the deficit and continuing to remember that lower taxes tend to generate more tax revenues because they free up entrepreneurs to invest and create jobs. And actually, both of those propositions are in all the major manifestos. It's simply a degree of, on the tiller as to how quickly you um, deal with the deficit and how quickly 
you tackle the tax burden. The next two are things which we absolutely need delivery on. And the one thing business will say, we're not in the politics of ideas as the business community, but we are in the job of delivery. And I would say there are a couple of things where government absolutely has to deliver. And my two are we have to get out there as a country and earn our corn around the world by exporting, and we have to tackle our national deficit on infrastructure if we want business to be able to get out there and export. So one really good example of that is we want more businesses to get on aeroplanes to far-flung parts of the world like Jakarta and Mexico City. You need more flights. And if you need more flights, you need another runway. And almost at the point where the incoming government's going to have to tackle that, sorry, is tackling a coalition, they've got to make a decision about the Davis report on aviation runway capacity. So deal with the urgent issues that need tackling. And finally, and this is the nearest I'll get, Chair, to a party comment, so I'll close a political comment that could be taken as a party comment, so I'll close on this. Business needs the next government to do two things at the same time. It needs the next government to remember that free and open markets generate jobs and wealth. So we don't want politicians of any party second-guessing markets, and particularly, we don't want politicians of any party interfering in independent regulators who set rules for markets. They can set remits, but not interfere in decisions. And the second one is, most businesses, I don't claim all, but most businesses want Britain to be a key part of a reformed European Union, with the emphasis on a reformed European Union. Because that, again, is about building bigger markets with which we can create jobs and improve living standards. So what business wants, in a nutshell, is delivery. And our job after the election, when we have a voice, is to remind our politicians to get on with the job of delivery. Pro-enterprise policies, because pro-enterprise policies are ultimately good for all of us as voters. Thank you. Thank you, John. Lord Billamore. Mm -hmm. I will if I may. Use, use the, the lectern or great. stroll to your heart's content. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a strange time we're going through. Here we have Christine Lagarde, head of the IMF, saying that Britain's economic ec performance was providing eloquent and convincing leadership for the rest of the EU. Independently, unprompted. And then you have Wolfgang Schauble, Germany's finance minister. The UK has done a very good job and the Conservatives have a very good plan for the future. I mean, look at what we've achieved. We've got low inflation, low interest rates, low unemployment, high unemployment, high growth rates compared with other countries in the developed world, jobs just being created, and yet you've got a government and the Conservative Party leading this government that is not going to be winning a majority from what we can all make out at this very moment. Although, you know, anything can happen. Um, as Netanyahu says, he loses the polls but wins the elections. Um, it is still possible for the Conservatives to get an outright majority. Unlikely, though, from, what, from all accounts. So what are they doing wrong? How can you be in this position? Oh, the economy is stupid. Well, the economy is great. So on that basis, what matters to people more than anything else? Any poll that you do is having a job. You've got jobs. So what, is, what have they done wrong? Why aren't they connecting? Why has this campaign been so negative? Why is it that suddenly, after the Scottish referendum, within six months, I've been to Waterloo this last weekend, well, the Scots lost the battle, but with their Trojan horse, visible Trojan horse, they might win the war. This is bizarre. This is something that nobody can understand, which is why, as John said, nobody can predict what's going to be happening in these elections. Why? Why is this the case? And I look at India, where I'm originally from, and I was with the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in January, and you look at what he achieved exactly a year ago in May, where he achieved what people did not predict, the BJP won an outright majority, which in India was for the first time in three decades. Otherwise, there were always coalitions in India. And the coalitions, invariably, the tail would wag the dog. The communists in a coalition would stop any, any sort of reform for the economy. It was horrendous. 
And now, finally, you've got a prime minister in India who's got an outright majority, and he's out there, <laughs> and he's got a vision, and he's spelling out his vision, and he's implementing his vision with power, with inspiration. Now, I think maybe that's what's lacking. He won because he had a vision for the country. He could articulate that vision. Two, now he's been given the opportunity to deliver that vision. What is the real vision that the parties are putting forward for us now? All I can see is negative. I can see the Labour Party trying to take us back to the 1970s. When I came as a student here, studying right here in the city of London in the early 80s from India, Britain was a sick man of Europe. Britain had no respect in the world economy whatsoever. And what is Ed Miliband's policies? Trying to take us, I believe, back to the 1970s. We're going back three decades, losing all the respect that we've earned over all these years. <coughs> On the other hand, you've got a Conservative Party that is laying out an austerity, trying to be sensible, trying to do the right thing. Well, I chaired a debate in the House of Lords, and let me make it clear, I'm an independent cross-bench pair, so I can say what I want to. I'm not taking any sides over here. I chaired a debate on the economy with some really eminent economists on that panel. Half of them said, if we hadn't had austerity, and these are eminent economists, we would have a growth rate today, in cumulative terms, 5 to 10% higher than it would be. On the other hand, you had the other half of the economists who said, if we hadn't had austerity, the global markets wouldn't have believed us, and everything would have tanked. But on the other hand, we have the backup of the Bank of England that we all take for granted. So we don't know who's right and who's wrong, but we do know the position that we're in right now. We have a conservative party that wants to continue with this message to the extent that they want to cut spending down to 35 36% of GDP. This is right back to the 1930s when there was no welfare state. I, think, I don't think that's practical. What actually needs to happen is to have an attractive tax rates and sensible spending. 40% of GDP would be absolutely fine. So to conclude in my, in my opening remarks, I think that what nobody is doing in this election is making the British people feel proud of all the achievements of this country that we all take for granted and that for people outside Britain <coughs> do not appreciate enough about us. Has anyone spoken? about how actually manufacturing is not dead in this country, and manufacturing is not just alive and kicking. We have best of the best manufacturing in every field you can imagine. Automobiles, Jaguar Land Rover. Owned by Tata, doesn't matter. Beer. <laughs> We're very proud of the medals we win of the beer we produce in Burton-on-Trent. Aerospace. High-end manufacturing of every sort. Design. Our accountants, our lawyers, our financial sector, our universities. Best in the world. Nobody talks about our great capabilities. Nobody makes this country feel proud and paints that vision that makes us as 1% of the world's population still the fifth largest economy in the world and at the top table of the world in every aspect. Thank you. It's a great uh, privilege to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, first of all, with the illustrious uh, panel, uh, John Cridland uh, doing a magnificent job in terms of representing British industry, and uh, Lord Bill Moria, uh, crossbench peer, um, and also, I believe, a donor to the Conservative Party. Um, I, be I believe so, anyway. Um, but the most important thing about being here today is the, um, is the audience. Um, the reason that we wanted to be involved in this is that um, this audience represents growth and disruption. New ways of thinking, new ways of doing things, uh, new ways of realizing the potential of this country. And that's the agenda that I'd like to speak to today. I believe one of the reasons why this election is so close to call is because of a profound lack of trust in politicians. Um, people no longer believe that politicians will deliver on their promises, and even if they did, they're not sure whether any of those promises would make any difference. And so we, uh, we stand and we reserve our judgment, no longer convinced that anyone has any real answers to the big challenges that face us moving forward. We're tired of the uh, petty debates that go on and the very small policy recommendations that are made on all sides because those are the only things that politicians believe that they can deliver. But that lack of trust is something which also applies to the business community. Uh, trust in business, the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer in large corporations demonstrates that only one in five of the population any longer believes any chief executive to tell the truth. 
trust in large business is down to uh, below 50%, its lowest level in history since the 1950s. So there's a profound lack of trust in all institutions which the public have previously sought or looked to to provide leadership. What they're looking for, uh, as Lord Bill and Moria has said, is a sense of vision and a sense that we can do things differently in this country and a sense that, yes, we believe that we can achieve those things. Because we are facing many significant challenges, and just to lay out a few, uh, one in three chief executives believe that lack of talent or a talent bottleneck is one of the most serious risks moving forwards. How is that going to be tackled? Productivity levels in the UK languish 17% below the G7. How's that going to be tackled? We have a society where the gap between rich and poor has grown, and we ask ourselves, how is that going to be tackled if we're going to build a sustainable economy? And we know we live in a global community, and yet the rate of exports in the country really lags behind with where it needs to be, and certainly some of our biggest competitors. So really big issues on which mostly we haven't heard any substantive answers throughout this election campaign. So what kind of, um, what kind of manifesto would we be looking to hear had we a politician who was brave enough to say this is what we need to achieve? Well, I think they would start with a view that creating a vibrant economy is absolutely vital if people and business are to thrive. And I think that's a, a platform on which everyone in this room would agree. But what does that mean? Well, to create a vibrant economy, first and foremost, you need to have trust and integrity in financial markets. And today we don't. That needs to be restored. We need to have an environment and infrastructure that is capable of supporting the growth in the economy, whether that's through conventional means or through the inf information superhighway, and that that is available to power London to the next level of performance that this great city is capable of. Yet right now, that investment is slow, and we have some of the slowest rates in the UK on broadband. And we need to create organisations, companies, which are capable of delivering sustainable growth. We have a fantastic record, and many of you are part of this, of creating wonderful startups with brilliant ideas. But we're not great at sustaining that, of taking those small, unique organisations and growing them to be global powerhouses. So how do we do that? Uh, this morning, uh, you've heard a number of people talk about how business needs to move from being the best to being the best for the world. And we need to understand how we can do that. So moving forward, I'd like to see an agenda that really was pro-small businesses, that was pro a talent agenda, which meant that we not only trained the right apprentices, but gave them pathways so that they could progress through organizations, rather than like they do in Germany that we had closer links between universities and small businesses so those innovation hubs could really grow like it is in Cambridge and Bristol, but we need that in every major city. That had a progressive view about immigration into the country so that we are and continue to be a magnet for talent. That invests in infrastructure and that above all provides sustain sustainability uh, with regard to, and security with regard to Europe. All of these things are essential if innovation is to thrive. Everybody in this audience is about innovating. Innovating and creating organizations that really do have the potential to shape a vibrant economy. Thank you very much. Right, so we've heard some fascinating um, thoughts throughout that. And one thing that struck me as I was listening to that, and Norman, you were talking about uh, policies for small business. John, you represent businesses of all sizes, I, I, I understand. Are we talking about one, that there's probably not one set of policies for business as a whole. There's probably different policies for different sizes of business. Does it really matter what the politicians are saying at this point? Is it what they put in their manifestos that matters? Or is it the vibe you get from them about business and the decisions they will make if they have some power. Is that what, as business people, we should be focusing on? John, come to you. 
So the vast majority of what the CBI deals with is what I call the law of unintended consequence. It's not what politicians meant to do, it's what they actually did. Because I think this election demonstrates um, the ground that politicians are fighting over is rather smaller and tighter than it would have been 50 years ago when Clem Attlee and Winston Churchill were talking about privatization or nationalization, state control or market control. Um, actually, politics today clearly has a lot of ideas in it, but it's much more about the politics of delivery and the politics of delivery. Can the National Health Service get through a winter with enough hospital beds? Can, it, can we uh, provide enough teachers for classrooms? These are issues on which politicians need managerial skills. And I think businesses just want a government that can deliver. They want competence in delivery. And at the end of the day, business will get on with business. It will, not, it will find a way of navigating through politics. Mm. But it would rather like a government that could deliver what it set out to do. Lord Villamoria, and I do apologise, we're going to have to keep our conversation a little bit shorter, so we won't have time for any questions in this part, but we'll, we'll carry on here for the moment. Uh, what frustrates me is that um, I don't think politicians actually understand business, uh, and that is, for any entrepreneur, anyone in business, hugely frustrating. If they understood business, they'd be able to prioritise things much better. They wouldn't be able to, I mean, Ed Miliband, in the way, um, I know you're oh, the world expert on zero-hours contracts, but to make that the main plank of his business focus. Um, of course, we shouldn't uh, in any way uh, deal badly with anyone in any way, let alone people on zero-hour contracts. But to make that the bedrock of his speech, then to focus just on non-doms, it's all very political. It's not what business wants to hear. Business wants to hear, are you going to create the environment for us to flourish? Are you going to do the right things in creating a fair tax structure? Is it fair at the moment that 1% of taxpayers pay 30% of the tax take? With non-DOMs, you want to get rid of the non-DOMs, but just a few thousand people, a few thousand, put an eight billion pounds into this economy and everything else that they bring in. These are not easy, but if somebody is not, doesn't understand business, I find that incredibly frustrating. Norman, do, does, do, do all the parties understand business, do you think? No, I, I, having worked with um, politicians from all uh, different colours and persuasions, I, um, I haven't found many of them that have a particularly business-savvy orientation. Uh, you only need to look at the leaders of most of the major parties. None of them have spent any serious time in industry. So I think there is an issue, and I would echo the points that have been made. Um, I would um, challenge um, John's um, perspective that we need politicians who can be managers. Actually, I don't think we do. Uh, I think we need business to be managers um, <clears throat> and people who are running institutions to be managers. I think we need politicians who are capable of setting out the kind of society that we want to live in. I think they have a bigger and broader job. Um, to fight the unexpected, though, don't they? They, they do. And, and that's a managerial skill. It is. But I think that the broader context of what kind of world are we trying to shape, what kind of world are we trying to, uh, to create for people, is hugely important. With regard to Lord Bill and Maury's point about the narrowness of the various political campaigns, I think he's absolutely right. I mean, I think the Labour Party have gone after their core vote, so hence zero hours contracts, non-DOMs. It's been about securing traditional Labour voters. <laughs> got that much attention, the zero-hours contract. Well, it, was it, written on it, it surprised me. I mean, I wrote this report, um, I don't know, 18 months ago, and uh, I was somewhat surprised to find it at the centrepiece of the election campaign, But <laughs> um, because I wrote it as a specialist in, in, in that area. Um, but I, th I think what's interesting is that both the Labour Party and the Conservatives are going after core votes, and that's why there isn't much movement in the polls around the particular uh, campaigns. It's because they've secured traditional Tory voters and they've secured traditional Labour voters and they're not really getting a great deal of cutover with people swinging one, from one group to another and that's why the remaining kind of mid-30s on both sides. Can I ask just as we sadly come to the end of our time if as you as various people have observed today the benefits of recovery economic recovery have perhaps not been sold to the people well enough or people haven't felt the benefits enough if that's one of the problems that the election has unearthed, does business need to do more? Does business need to pay people more, pay people differently, treat people differently in order to try and convince people that the recovery is real? So the economy definitely is recovering. And I think notwithstanding the GDP figures yesterday, which I think will be uprated over time, mm. actually the prospects for this year are pretty strong for the British economy. I still think we will grow the fastest of the G7, and I think the recovery is broadly based and deeply rooted. But it matters a lot to me that not everybody can see it, touch it, smell it. 
And gosh, I've been saying as head of the CBI for at least a year that business needs to give its workers a pay rise. I don't apologize that we had a jobs-rich recovery in 2010 through 2014, and the price we paid for a jobs-rich recovery was it wasn't a wage-rich recovery. But as business investment is picking up, as businesses invest in new technology, as they get more innovative, theme of this event, as productivity then rises, they should be genuinely sharing the benefits of that growth with their employees as well as their shareholders. And they are beginning to do so. Politicians can't mandate those pay rises. It should be organically from wealth creators and entrepreneurs like Karen. Ten and that seconds. is a good thing. Ten seconds from either of you if you'd like to continue. Yep. I, I couldn't agree with, with the fact that business will, will do it on its own accord. Uh, what, I, what I feel is that, that, that they, nobody has prioritized in terms of take the vision for this country in the future. What is it, the things that I spelt out that we're best of the best in the world in just about every field you can imagine, how do we stay there? And yet our universities, we under we underinvest. So Ed Miliband talks about reducing the fees to 6,000 pounds. Fine, if he wants to do that and he can fund that, he's missing the boat. Has he talked about investing more into universities because we invest less than the EU average, OECD average, way below America? Innovation that Norman spoke about. We invest in R&D and innovation way below the EU, OECD, and American average. Those are the areas that we need. To, not one party has spoken about that and encouraging that innovation. And that would be music to our ears. That would make us more productive. That would continue to take this country we forward. We spoke about that right here just before lunch, so we are clearly on the ball. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I apologise we don't have longer to talk about this fascinating topic, but uh, I'll hand back to Michael. Anna, thank you very much, and thank you to the panel. Thank you.